say good afternoon. I'm Greg Nedved. I'm the president of the National Museum of Language. And uh, we're delighted to have you with us today for this very interesting and important topic. Just a little bit about the museum. I won't say too much because I don't want to cut into the speaker time. We've been around since the late 1990s. In 2008, we were uh, in College Park. We had an actual building. But in 2013, we made the strategic decision to go virtual, and we've been virtual ever since. And uh, you're looking at that result of us being virtual. We're, we're able to have programs from you know all over the United States. But a couple things about us. Uh, we cover languages in entirety. If it's language related, we're interested in it, which makes us unique among language museums out there. And we're also one of the very few, as far as I know at least, entirely virtual museums in the sense that we don't have a building. Uh, we're always looking for people. You know, what a surprise, you know, most museums are. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested in helping us out, um, you know, let us know, you know how to reach us. And I also, before, you know, before I, I, I get off the podium here, I do want to just introduce or give a shout out to uh, Dr. Jill Robbins, you know, who is our vice president and our chief technology officer. This all work. And very important, especially today, Dr. Laura Murray, our chief uh, development officer, who uh, many of you know, and she, of course, is the brainstorm behind our Language and Leadership Council, which is makes us truly nationwide. So at this point, I think Laura would be the proper person to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Kristen. Uh, is it Davin or Davinum? It's Davin. Oh, I wasn't even close. Okay, it's a good time <laughs> for me to stop. All right, Laura. Oh, and I'll before take before Laura begins, uh, I just want to to uh, announce that. Um, uh, I, I will be adding everybody to our mailing list for our newsletter. Um, if you don't want to join it, you can simply click on the unsubscribe button. But uh, that mail that newsletter will be coming to you on a monthly basis and letting you know about future presentations and all of the, our exhibit development. Uh, we've been quite active in developing our virtual exhibits in the past year. Uh, one of them is uh, one that could be used by teachers at the the secondary level and above that's on social justice poetry. Um, Laura Murray is responsible for spearheading that and um, we're adding on to it with uh, Afri po poetry from Africa uh, in the next couple of months. Uh, we're going to be having a, a live uh, poetry reading uh, in Greenbelt, Maryland uh, this later this spring. So go ahead, uh, Laura. Thank you. All right, well, um, I was very happy to meet uh, Kristen Davin virtually just a couple of months ago um, when we decided to make a deep dive uh, as a museum into seal of bioliteracy programs. And uh, Dr. Davin was highly recommended to us as a person we should get to know. And so we had a meeting back in uh, early November uh, with about four or five people from the museum and uh, Dr. Davin who joined us to talk about seal of bioliteracy and what the museum could do with the seal of bioliteracy. So uh, for those who don't know Kristen Davin, she is an associate professor of foreign language education in the Cato College of Education at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. And she teaches second language methodology and assessment as main areas. Her research focuses on second language development, second language assessment, language teacher development, and the seal of bioliteracy, where she has been one of the leading scholars of what's happening with the seal of bioliteracy. She's published numerous articles and she co-wrote a book Promoting Multilingualism in Schools, a Framework for Implementing the Seal of Bioliteracy. So we're uh, really honored to have her here uh, speaking to the members and friends of the National Museum of Language to talk about the Seal of Bioliteracy, past, present, and future. So thank you very much for being here. We really appreciate it. 
Thank you all. I'm so excited to be here and to get to speak with you all today about my research. Um, this is just such a wonderful opportunity um, for me. And as you'll see, I'm very passionate um, about the seal of bioliteracy and, and the potential that it holds. So I'm, I'm so happy to be here and thank you all for joining me. It's nice to see some familiar names and, and faces. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar, the seal of biliteracy is a recognition given by a school district or state to students who have attained proficiency in two or more languages. Um, so to earn a seal of biliteracy, students typically have to demonstrate proficiency in reading, writing, listening, and speaking in English and another language. Um, the way that they do that, to just give you a, a big broad overview before I jump into all the details, is that students can demonstrate proficiency of their world language proficiency by um, passing or reaching a minimum score on a language proficiency assessment, I should say. Um, if there isn't an assessment of the language in which a student wishes to earn a seal of biliteracy, sometimes uh, districts or states offer alternative assessment processes, um, like a, a language portfolio or something along those lines. Some states allow for um, indigenous um, groups to certify that, um, you know, that members are proficient in an indigenous language. And then there are a few states, five or six at this point, where students can demonstrate proficiency of another language um, just by fulfilling a seat time requirement. So if they were to take, for example, four years of Spanish, sometimes there's a minimum GPA required, sometimes not, then that would count as language proficiency for that student. Um, this is typically takes place during high school. So students earn the seal of bioliteracy at high school graduation. Um, they also have to demonstrate proficiency in English. Uh, in most states, Hawaii is really unique in that um, it doesn't have to necessarily be um, English and another language. It can be Hawaiian and another language. So that's um, that's something I'm I'm really happy about. Um, in the other states, it's it's English and another language. Um, to demonstrate English proficiency, students can. In some states, they have to pass an English assessment. Um, in some states, they can score a minimum GPA in a course of study, like English language arts classes in high school, and then then. In a growing number of states, students can demonstrate proficiency by graduating from high school. So the district or, or state says, if you graduate from high school here, then you um, are proficient in English. So this is just something to keep in the back of your mind as I talk through some of what the implications of uh, this is today of this seal of biliteracy. Um, the research that I'm gonna share with you, much of it has been conducted with my colleague, Dr. Amy Heineke, who's at Loyola University Chicago. Um, and over the years, we've published um, the findings from our research in various journals. So we, we first um, learned about and really became interested in the seal of biliteracy around 2014 when we were both in Chicago um, and went to um, a conference and heard um, some teachers from a school talking about how the seal of biliteracy was impacting their curriculum and their students. Um, we 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 put our heads together and thought we've got to learn more about this. This could be such a game changer um, for language education in the United States. And since then, we've just been um, learning everything we can about the seal of biliteracy and trying to help um, people with implementation. So my talk today has four main parts. I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the characteristics and origins of the seal of biliteracy. Then I'm going to talk about the benefits of seal of biliteracy implementation. I'm going to talk about that in terms of students, um, schools and districts, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, institutions of higher education, so colleges and universities. I'm going to talk a little bit about K-16 pathways after that. Um, so yes, the seal of biliteracy is typically war awarded to students graduating from high school, um, but what can we do you know, earlier than that? And then I'm going to talk a, lot, a little bit about variations in policies from state to state um, so that you get an idea of how the seal of biliteracy differs in places and some of the implications of that. And I'll um, conclude with some recommendations for what I would uh, like to see in the future. After each of these parts, I'm going to have um, 
a slide um, and I'm going to ask for some questions and comments. So rather than waiting to the very end when you might have had a question, you know, 30 minutes ago that you needed answer before you could focus on the next part, I'm going to pause um, four times and, and ask for comments or questions um, just to make sure, you know, we're all on the same page and, and so that those, you know, are, are sprinkled throughout. So I, I know a lot of this is, is not new to anyone here, um, but it's just to give you an overview of what our world language education looks like here in the United States. You know, only about 20% of our students in public schools, one in five students um, are enrolled in a world language or a language other than English. Only one in five states have a world language graduation requirement. Requirement. So in a lot of states, students are not required to take any language at all. Um, so that's, and in some states now there's been a debate about whether computer programming, you know, should, should fulfill that two, two year requirement that, that some states have, but the vast majority do not have a graduation requirement. Um, and here in the United States, um, only about 10% of English dominant individuals you know, are multilingual. So we've got this kind of tricky area we're in where we, you know, it's some, some places want to teach more world language um, and incorporate more world language, but it can be hard to find teachers if if you follow the teacher shortage. That's that's a huge, huge problem. Um, so it's, we, we've got some work to do here in terms of our, our world language education. Um, this has all been shaped, you know, by so many different, and historical factors, um, but we have a history um, in this country oftentimes of pushing aside languages other than English um, and instead trying to replace those with English from the Indian boarding schools, Native American boarding schools, um, from English only laws that were, you know, instituted in California um, and Arizona and Massachusetts. Um, we've just kind of gotten a history of we just kind of have a history of, of you know pushing out those other languages um, for English. So it's exciting. The seal of biliteracy is very exciting because it's one of the first policies we've had that is saying, no, we we want students to learn a different language or another language. We want to add other languages in addition to English, or we want to preserve students' first languages, you know, as we teach English. Um, we all know that. There are so many brain benefits of bilingualism, right? Um, research has shown that um, students, perform, bilingual students outperform monolingual students in terms of academic performance, achievement tests. Um, higher executive functioning has been linked to bilingualism. Um, a delayed onset of dementia as people age. Um, there's just all this research that you know shows how important it is or how valuable it can be to learn multiple languages. Um, and yet we still have such a long way to go to make that a norm here in the United States. Um, so the seal of biliteracy originated in California. Um, there was an, an advocacy group called Californians Together, um, and they wanted to combat that English only law that was there um, in, in the state that prohibited students from um, you know, having bilingual education in schools. So students whose first language was something other than English would be put in classes where it was English only all the time. Um, and they wanted to change these deficit based views of, of bilingualism. So, you know, there was this sense that you know, students th that, you know, knowing a language other than English was a deficit rather than an asset. So um, one school district started the seal of biliteracy policy um, and others heard about it. Um, and then this group became involved and they started working together um, to try to pass, you know, a statewide policy. And it took multiple attempts to get this passed, um, but finally, the seal of biliteracy was passed in California in 2011, um, and they began to implement it statewide. Um, and as other states heard about the seal of biliteracy in California, they started to create their own policies and adopt their own seal of biliteracy policies. 
Um, so what you see today on this map is that now 49 of the 50 states have a seal of biodiversity policy um, and South Dakota is in the early stages of creating one too. Um, so soon uh, we hope to be, you know, at all 50 states. So this has been really exciting and it's happened, you know, really fast over the past, you know, 11 years that, that everyone has, um, has adopted this policy. I'm going to pause right there. I've seen some questions coming in via the chat. Um, and I want to give an opportunity here before I start moving into the benefits and the more specific characteristics of the seal of biliteracy for you all to ask questions that you have. Um, so I see one, does the seal mm -hmm. itself identify the additional languages that one is proficient in? Um, that's a really good question. So uh, in most states, when students earn a seal of biliteracy, a lot of times it's noted on the transcript and it might vary from state to state whether the language of the seal is noted on the transcript as well. In a lot of places, there will be an emblem or an actual kind of seal put on the student's diploma. Um, and that typically does not have the other language. It just says, you know, that the student or demonstrates that the student earned the seal of biliteracy. Um, but, you know, in a, in a lot of states, part of what makes the student eligible for earning the seal is by passing an approved uh, proficiency assessment. And so then they get a certificate from the testing company um, that says the level that they scored um, and the language. So for example, two very common ones used here in the United States are the Apple test. Um, and the other one is the stamp test. So stamp is by Avant assessment. Apple is administered by language testing international. And those both send students score reports with their score and the language. And then the student would have that, you know, as their proof of language in addition to the seal. Um, another question, is it possible for homeschool parents to issue a seal? Again, that's something that varies from state to state. Um, in some states, they'll have a website portal where you can go online and fill in the necessary information about the student and the state will award the seal in that case. Um, in other states, um, that might not be possible. I'm not sure. It, that's something that you would want to reach out to your state level world language person about to find out. Um, Michael asked about indigenous languages. If I've worked with any indigenous language immersion programs, Michael, I made a note. I wrote your name down earlier in the introduction to reach out to you. Um, uh, my colleagues and I, Dina Yoshimi and Pila Wilson in Hawaii, just um, received an uh, actual research priorities grant to study the seal of biliteracy in, in Hawaii and how that's being implemented. And then our goal was to bring that back to the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians here in North Carolina and work with them to develop a pro pro proficiency assessment and award the seal. So that's that's what we're working on. Um, in terms of, I'll answer this last question and then I'll keep going. This is great. Thank you all for these great questions. Um, are there any languages that are not considered a world language? Um, so that's a tricky question. Um, students can earn in, you know, in, in um, languages like Latin. Um, they can earn the seal of biliteracy in American Sign Language. States like Washington, for example, and Minnesota have done a whole lot of work to award, Washington specifically, to award students a seal of biliteracy in any language in which, you know, they request it. Michelle Aoki, I saw earlier, is on this call. She's uh, spearheaded a lot of that work, so she'd be a great person to chat with um, about that. Um, but it, it depends on the state in terms of, and the school sometimes, in terms of what languages they award a seal of biliteracy in. But the most equitable approach is to work toward awarding that seal of biliteracy, you know, in any language that, that a student speaks. It gets a little bit tricky sometimes with Creole languages or languages that might not be um, officially recognized as, as a language. That can be problematic. I do have an article where I talked about that a little bit. If anyone wants reference to that, you can email me later. And then the last- uh, Kristen, if I can just uh, interrupt because I'm the one that asked the question. Mm -hmm. My question is, what is, a, what is a world language? What do they consider a world language? That's really that's, a good question. That's a good question. So. Um, I would say 
my definition would be any language, you know, other than, than English. I, I'm not sure if that's a good enough answer. It's something I haven't thought about. Um, but I mean, students have earned the seal of biliteracy and all sorts in, you know, all, all languages taught in school, but also, you know, languages, you know, indigenous language like Quechua or Cherokee um, in Native American languages like Lakota Dakota or Oromo. Um, so. I think I think probably um, a literary con lang would not be considered a world language, constructed languages. Right, that's a good point. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, and then um, let's see. One, I'll, I'll look at this last one from Rick Jackson. There are considerable variations across the different states and within states and criteria that must be used to demonstrate proficiency. That's exactly right. And I'll go through some of those later on in this talk today, um, including variation in skill modalities that must be demonstrated. Yep, um, is ACTful or another organization working to make, make those more standardized? Um, so this is a really tricky question and it's something that I'm gonna talk about at the end when I talk about future directions. Um, you know, this because the seal of biliteracy was such a grassroots effort and states created their own policies suitable for their context and based on the information that they had at the time, there's no one kind of oversight or one kind of organization that's coordinating things across all states. Sealofbiliteracy.org, which is run by Arthur Chow, he's been an amazing resource for this movement. He's an amazing resource for anything seal of biliteracy related. He's done all, I mean, he's done all so much work. He has so much, so many great resources published on his website. And, and the big kind of language organizations have come together on multiple occasions twice to publish guidelines on what they think your seal of biliteracy should look like in each state. So it's like actful, TSOL, um, NABE, Californians Together, sealofbiliteracy.org, maybe Necessful also. Um, they have published their free online um, kind of implementation guidelines for the seal of biliteracy. They give recommendations. And every year there are states that are modifying their policies and making changes. So they are starting to converge a little bit more and become more similar, these state seal of biliteracy policies. Um, but I wouldn't say that ACTful is necessarily the one leading that work. That ACTful previously stood for the American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages. Now it's just the acronym, but it's kind of the overseeing body of world language education here in the US. So, okay. Um, yes, American Sign Language does qualify for a SEAL. Oh, and I see that Dr. Robbins already answered that. Okay, I'm gonna keep going, let's see. So benefits of the seal of biliteracy. First, I'm going to talk about benefits to students. I have some research citations down here. There are other articles now that also talk about this. But again, you can reach out to me for more information about that later on. So what do students perceive as benefits of the seal of biliteracy? Um, this research study, we kind of disaggregated to show what students whose first language was English um, what they reported as, as being benefits, and then students who we called linguistically diverse or multilingual learners, students whose, where another language was spoken in their home, um, what they reported as um, their motivations. And these data came from surveys of around 200 students um, in Illinois um, back around 2017. So um, just to give you some context, um, but largely students when we asked, you know, why do you want a seal of biliteracy? They talked about future employment um, and future career use. They thought it would help them get a job to have a seal of biliteracy. And they thought it would be useful language proficiency, you know, in their future careers. There are, and I will talk more about this later, but there are a few states um, where anyone who earns a seal of biliteracy um, can request credit at state institutions of higher education for that seal of biliteracy. Minnesota and Illinois do that. Um, in those two states, it's legislated, but also um, University of Maine system does that as well. And then there are more you know, colleges and universities who are doing so voluntarily. But students were very motivated by the opportunity for college credit. Um, students 
English dominant students reported that they wanted that additional seal on their transcript. And a lot of this had to do with um, competitiveness for college. So they wanted to stand out from their peers in the college application process and thought that having a seal of biliteracy um, would help with that. Other various reasons that students reported were ability to travel abroad, ability to speak to others, um, ability to speak to family members. They thought it would help them with assessment scores. Um, you see here on this next slide, the responses from the linguistically diverse students. They were quite similar. Um, future career use was still at the very top um, or toward the very top future employment opportunities, college credit as well, um, but appreciation of, di of cultural diversity um, was much a much more common response here. Um, and I'll get into some of the qualitative data related to that too. Um, but, you know, the students felt acknowledged by the seal of biliteracy and, and thought that it would also, you know, um, kind of be a gift to their parents or an acknowledgement of the hard work of their parents as well. In terms of post-secondary opportunities, um, when we asked students, we conducted focus groups with students and asked them, you know, why are you interested in earning a seal of biliteracy? Um, one student told us, I was just thinking about it for college because maybe they'll give credit. Um, and if I don't do so well on the advanced placement college credit exam, then I can take the stamp or this Apple test, which might not be as, as difficult um, and get some college credit. Another student said, I think that it makes you a more valuable candidate when you're applying for jobs in the future. And another student said, it, look, it just looks better on resumes. You'd rather have someone who has multiple languages as compared to someone who can only speak English. This is always my favorite part of the research is hearing you know, from the students themselves. Um, and much of what these students said is, you know, has been reflected in some other recent research. Um, so there was um, a report done by New American Economy, um, and they found that, you know, in 2010, there were about 240,000 job postings that were looking for bilingual workers. Um, and just five years later, that number had, you know, more than doubled to 630,000. Um, the fastest growing in those listings were high prestige jobs, as the study called them, um, like financial managers, editors, industrial engineers, and that in particular job postings for candidates who spoke Chinese, um, Spanish, or Arabic um, greatly increased. Um, so the students, you know, their, their opinions are, are valid and that, yeah, a lot of employers are looking um, for bilingual employees. One thing that was really interesting to me that we hadn't predicted when we created the survey that came out during the focus group, so you it wouldn't you wouldn't have seen it in that earlier table, um, was the confidence boost. So students described that you know once they took these language proficiency tests and got whatever the passing score was, um, they they felt more confident in their abilities. Um, so students said that they felt that the proficiency assessment was more challenging than the grades given by teachers because they said things like, oh, well, anyone can get an A in class. Um, another student said, I wasn't always confident in my ability to speak Spanish or anything, but taking this assessment and learning my level of the language makes me more confident that I know a lot of Spanish better than I think I do. So this was interesting, and this was something that not just students who had learned another language in school reported, but even students who came from homes where that language was spoken um, also made similar comments and talked about what a confidence boost it was for them to earn a seal of biliteracy. Students also really wanted proof of their language ability. So they talked about that um, quite a bit. They said, you know, the seal of biliteracy test is a good indicator of whether you're good enough to speak your own language. I thought this was fascinating how the student who, he was a first generation immigrant had moved here, um, spoke Somali, um, just the way he, he phrased this, whether you're good enough to speak your language or not. Um, it really shows the power you know, of, of assessments, which can be a little bit scary, um, but let's see what else. Um, another student, also a first generation immigrant who spoke Somali said, now I'm no, now I know I'm proficient in Somali. 
Um, and I think this is just a product of this era of accountability and assessment that we live in. And students are so accustomed to tests and so many high stakes decisions are made on tests that now they kind of look for that external validation of a test. Um, a second generation immigrant who spoke Hmong she, um, said, the test will make you more believable. So, you know, if you go to an employer and, and say you're bilingual or have it on your resume, if you have the seal of biliteracy, that will be the proof. Um, and then a first generation immigrant we spoke to whose first language was Somali said it would make my parents feel good about themselves. Um, so um, I'll, I'll talk more about that particular student um, and this quote later on, but that was interesting. So one of the students said, um, we did a follow-up interview, follow-up interviews with a lot of the students who participated in those focus groups two years after they had earned the seal of biliteracy when they had moved on to college or post-graduation. And this particular student said, last year, end of 2018, I worked as a translator. She said, the interview wasn't going so well. And I mentioned I had a seal of biliteracy. And then the interviewer was like, oh, send me a picture of that, would you? And I was like, yeah. And then I sent it. And then the next morning he was like, congrats, you got it. So she just talked about how the whole, the whole tone of the interview changed um, once she had mentioned that she had earned you know, a seal of biliteracy. So I'm gonna show just this quick, it's uh, about two minutes. It's a video that um, has students talking about you know, why they pursued a seal of biliteracy. Sometimes it's more powerful coming from them themselves. I'm gonna, we, we tested the audio earlier and it was working. So I'm gonna start playing this and not pause and ask you, but if it, if you cannot hear it, please someone unmute and let me know. From. They came to this country for a better, for me to get better education. And that is what I accomplished. It's a piece of me that gives me more pride, more confidence in myself. Which really is what connects you to the rest of the world. My family speaks Arabic and I could also speak Spanish with other classmates and people also in the workplace as well. And I think especially in our time of um, technology where we can connect with people from all across the world, it's important to be able to communicate with other I decided to pursue myself next you to the rest of the world. My family speaks Arabic and I could also speak Spanish with other classmates and people also in the workplace as well. And I think especially in our time of um, technology where we can connect with people from all across the world, it's important to be able to communicate with others around you. I'm just able if I go get a job elsewhere I could communicate with people in my workspace that maybe don't speak English or maybe need help. Like in our economy it's getting more of like foreign countries and like getting together and just having that multiple cultures getting together with one language, it can change so many things. It feels good to make an accomplishment that not a lot of people could. It's kind of very relieving to kind of show that on my transcript and everything because I know it's a foot in the door in a sense. It feels really exciting and satisfying because now you have an actual so, something to put up on your wall for, some, for your achievement in, in school and out of school. So I think I'm ready for the next challenge and try another one. So, You're going to try another one? Yeah. My father always tells me, I did better than your grandpa, so you need to do better than me. <laughs> so I'm just taking them steps to complete it. Okay. Um, let me go to the next slide. So I don't, nothing else starts playing there. But um, so just going back to someone's question I saw in the chat box earlier. Yes, students can earn a seal of biliteracy in more than one language, as you saw the boy speak about um, in that video. Students can earn a seal of biliteracy in Latin or other ancient languages. Um, and um, yes, uh, Greg, English and Spanish is the leading combination. Um, I'll check on what the next one is. There's a report. I'll show you where to find that. I'm, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I can look at that for you. And then um, Janice, I'm going to get to that question. Is there evidence that colleges are valuing the seal in a tangible way and admissions are giving college credit in just, just a couple minutes? So perfect. I love it. You guys are great. Okay. 
Um, so that was just a little bit of information on what students see as the benefit of the CO of bioliteracy. Um, next, I'm going to talk about districts and schools, um, what they are reporting um, as benefits of the CO of bioliteracy. And again, I'll state that you know, the seal of bioliteracy has only existed since 2011. In some states, you know, they've only adopted it in the last few years. So all of this research is, you know, very new. Um, and it's, I'm hoping that more and more individuals will study the seal of bioliteracy so we can get, you know, additional research and, and, and because this is just going to keep growing um, and changing as we move along. Um, and I can, um, I will state too that I'm going to give you all a copy of this presentation later, and it does have a link to that video in it. So in terms of districts, here's what we did a study, um, Amy Heineke, Linda Ignatz, and I did a study back in 2018 on the seal of bioliteracy with um, three different school districts in Illinois. Again, Illinois was an early, ad early adopter of the seal of bioliteracy, and that's where we were at the time. Um, and I like the policy that's present in that state. So um, what we found, uh, when we surveyed the teachers in these districts was that 50% of them indicated that the seal of bioliteracy had changed their, their instruction. So what that means is, you know, for students in Illinois and in most states to earn a seal of bioliteracy, they have to demonstrate proficiency in reading, writing, speaking, and listening on an approved assessment. And that assessment is not measuring whether they can conjugate verbs or whether they can translate a pack, uh, you know, a passage, or whether they know these advanced grammatical rules, it's measuring whether they can use the language, whether they can speak in the language, whether they can read, write. Um, and so that means that teachers who are might be using outdated methods where they're just focusing on grammar or drills, um, they see how their students perform on these assessments, and that. 56% of them indicated that, you know, that motivated them to change the way that they taught um, to, you know, incorporate more proficiency-based methods. 69% of the teachers that we surveyed indicated that it had changed the way they assess students' language in the classroom. So again, if the seal of bioliteracy assessments are measuring whether students can communicate in the language, then the assessments throughout the school year need to be measuring whether students can communicate as as well. Um, when we asked them to what extent implementation had changed their instruction and assessment, 31% um, said that they use those necessful, actful, can do statements more, which are proficiency focused, performance focused. 34% said that they use the national standards for teaching um, world languages more. 38% um, used proficiency guidelines more, 41% said they were including more instruction with speaking and listening in the classroom, 48% um, indicated that their assessment was more proficiency based. So there was evidence in these districts that implementing the seal of bioliteracy was having positive washback on the teacher's instruction. Um, at one of these very large high schools where the study took place, um, they had some initial evidence that enrollment in their world language courses was increasing because students wanted to earn the seal of bioliteracy. Um, so this table just shows their enrollment in the world languages that they offered. Unfortunately, they were phasing out Latin. So you see that's why the numbers for Latin decreased. Um, but for these other languages, you know, there was growth in the number of students enrolling in AP um, in AP language courses, which the teachers attributed to perhaps to um, seal of bioliteracy implementation, especially Spanish language here. Um, so some qualitative data to go with those numbers. Um, one of the world language department chairs said it's a nice award. And really, you know, those of us or a lot of folks have moved away from calling the seal of bioliteracy an, an award. Um, because it's more of a, a recognition of something that students have. Um, but she said, it's a nice award. You put the sticker on the diploma and you honor students for the skill. But as a department, you have to take on the responsibility to get kids to that level. She said, we really had to shift our curriculum to be sure that all of our teachers knew that by the end of level one, students needed to be solidly at novice mid, approaching novice high. She said, you can't just go in the classroom and teach and have your fingers crossed that they're going to get where you need them to get. 
because in a four-year setup like ours, it's got to be pretty aggressive to get them to intermediate mid or intermediate high, which is intermediate high was the proficiency level required for the seal of biliteracy in, in Illinois. Another teacher said, some teachers are very, or sorry, department chair said, some teachers are very grammar driven and that's been the reality. And as we have conversations about moving towards more proficiency and testing for what students can do versus what they can't do, that's been a big shift. So these department chairs spoke a lot about, you can see how the seal of biliteracy could have positive washback, could help with backward designing your curriculum um, in schools. When we asked students um, in a 2018 study that appeared in the Bilingual Research Journal about their perceived barriers to earning a seal of biliteracy, we said, you know, why do you think more students aren't earning a seal of biliteracy? Um, they talked a lot about uh, a, a lack of confidence in those world language schools, lack of information about how to earn a seal of biliteracy and what it was. What was really concerning about the second one, if you see the blue line, this was reported much more commonly by linguistically diverse students. Um, and so that was problematic. That told us that the students who were in world language classes were getting the information for the most part um, about the seal of biliteracy, but the students who weren't, who spoke a home language other than English um, weren't getting the information that they needed. Um, so that was something that that district worked on a lot. Cost of language assessment, this is, um, this is really something to think about. Those assessments I mentioned earlier often cost, you know, between $20, $25 per student to take. Some districts pay for that, they budget to pay for that assessment for students. And some districts do not, and, and they require students to pay for it if they wanna take it. Um, so in this particular district where the school did not pay for it unless the student was on free and reduced price lunch, um, so some students indicated that that cost, that $25 or whatever it was, was a barrier. And then this one, late start studying world languages. So if you think back to that um, slide I showed you in the very beginning, um, in terms of only one in five students is enrolled in world languages and only one in five states has a world language requirement, you know, the, the level of proficiency required for seal of biliteracy is, is in many cases intermediate, mid, intermediate, high which is intermediate mid is often considered like a survive and cope level. You could be dropped off in the country and you could survive with that level of language. So you can create with the language, you can speak in sentences, um, you can speak some, not, not, not necessarily with accuracy, but some in, in various timeframes. Um, and, and that can take you know four years oftentimes um, in many programs or for many languages at least. So that was a problem that many students identified. Other problems that some students spoke about was a lack of avail availability of a test in the language they wanted. They didn't have room in their schedule for language classes. They lacked confidence, lacked encouragement. Um, so when asked about barriers, um, most teachers, 56% of teachers indicated that students didn't begin studying the world language early enough, especially um, in, in this district, they spoke about Hebrew and Chinese. So Chinese, for example, is considered um, a more difficult language to learn than Romance languages because it's so different from, um, from English uh, and the characters system, the writing system is different. Um, and so the teacher said, you know, four years just, you know, isn't enough to earn a seal of biliteracy um, in, in Chinese. Um, and so that she said that could be very discouraging for students. And then this is just a table that comes from Avant Assessment. Um, they have huge compilation of data from so many students. And this red line kind of shows us that um, it typically takes, you know, about four years to reach this intermediate mid level of proficiency um, in a language. So I'm going to talk more about extended sequences of study later, but it's very important. Um, so here's another spot for questions. I'm going to open up the chat um, and look at some of the questions you all have so far. Okay. How is language competency in the additional language assessed? Um, in most states, it's by um, an approved assessment. 
that measures reading, writing, listening, and speaking. So a lot of times that's an um, Apple test. It's called AAPPL um, by administered by Language Teaching International and or STAMP 4S, which is administered by Avant Assessment. Um, a lot of states have a provision where if there is not a practical and affordable assessment of all four domains, reading, writing, listening, and speaking of a language, then you can measure productive skills only. So speaking and writing. So that um, promotes greater equity and seal of bioliteracy implementation. So that's important. And then some states have an alternative assessment protocol. So if there is not affordable and practical assessment of a language, then there might be a portfolio option or some other way for students to show their proficiency. Okay, another question. Is language considered as part of overall cultural competency in the language they are learning? In other words, is it just about learning the language? Oh, this is a great question. Is it just about learning the language or do they also have to learn the culture? Okay, so that varies from state to state. In most cases, it's just the language. Washington, D.C., I believe, when they first started their seal of bioliteracy policy, they did have a cultural competence um, component that was required to get the seal of bioliteracy. But at, at some point, they changed that. So now you can get a seal of bioliteracy with distinction um, in Washington, D.C., if you do an activity or demonstrate cultural competency. And I do remember, I believe there's another state that has a cultural competency component as well. I just can't remember what it is off the top of my head. So it's not very common, but there are a couple states that, that have that. What a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. Can cultural competence even be separate? Yeah, from language competence. These are great points. Um, can a person get a seal retroactively if they were proficient during high school for a recent graduate? So I, I believe that they cannot in most states. I believe in, in most states, once the diploma is given or transcript is given, students cannot go back and apply for a state seal of bioliteracy. Now, there is a program called the Global Seal of Bioliteracy. It's different from the state seals, but similar in that you have to demonstrate proficiency in English in another language. Um, and the Global Seal of Bioliteracy, again, you could ask Michelle Aoki on this call more about that, or Linda Ignatz is the executive director of that program. But that is for a student, or excuse me, an individual anywhere in the world, not just US specific, not just high school specific, who wants um, this global seal of bioliteracy, they get a certificate um, and there's different levels of that. Um, so the, in response to Carolina's question, they could not get their state seal of bioliteracy after graduation, but they could if they wanted to get a global seal of bioliteracy. My research is focused on the state seals of bioliteracy, so I'm not as adept at talking about the global seal, but I can refer you to an, individuals who are. Um, are there where the teachers would not be able to earn? Are there situations? Are there situations where teachers would not be able to earn the seal? So I'm wondering if Carolyn meant students would not be able to earn the seal. Um, so the seal of bioliteracy is completely voluntary in most states um, because there is no federal funding for it yet. Um, there's a best act that they're trying to pass that would. Um, provide some funding for the seal of bioliteracy. So what that means is that you can have schools in two neighboring districts or even two schools in the same district and one might offer the seal of bioliteracy and one doesn't. And so that's part of why this advocacy work is so important because we need parents um, and others calling in and saying, why aren't you doing the seal of bioliteracy? Why doesn't my student or my child have access to the seal of bioliteracy? Because what ends up happening is that students who attend more resourced schools end up having access to the seal of bioliteracy than students who attend less resource schools that don't have the resources to implement the seal of bioliteracy or maybe the resources to pay for those assessments. And this is a huge equity issue, especially even more so in states where college credit is awarded to students who earn a seal because it's not fair if I get to go to a more resourced, you know, richer school that I can get a seal of bioliteracy and get 16 college credits when I go to college. And my peer who lives, you know, down the street goes to a different school and can't get that. So that's something that I'm 
really working hard on um, and I hope you all will help me to work hard on um, it would be great if we could get some federal funding um, so that all schools implemented the seal of bioliteracy. Um, did you compare students in dual language immersion programs starting in elementary versus world languages in secondary? Um, I haven't done any of that type of analysis. Avon Assessment has a lot of um, reports available via their website for free um, that, that shows numbers on these types of questions, I think. So that would be a great resource to go to. Ah, this is interesting. Um, the SEAL is also a way for already bilingual high school students to opt out of world language classes in high school, correct? So in certain states, yes. Um, in certain states, students can earn competency-based credits like North Carolina, where they demonstrate competency in another language. And by doing that, they get the credits for um, world language without taking those classes. So some states uh, do have a provision that allows for that. Um, when teachers are stuck with the old methodology, is it because they themselves are lacking adequate competence? This is a question, this is an interesting question because in, in my position, I teach world language methods courses. And often, you know, I teach, you know, all this amazing, all these amazing practices, high leverage teaching practices. We learn all, we learn all about the can do statements and the standards and everything. And then I go into their classroom during their student teaching and they're, and they're doing something that I never taught them. And I ask, where did you get this from? What are you doing? And you know, a lot of times they say, oh, well, this, this is how my teacher taught me. This is how I learned a language. Um, and yeah, it's telling your students to open your book to page 163 and do exercise B is way easier than finding an authentic text and engaging students in you know, uh, an interactive conversation in the target language about the meaning of that text. So that's a big question and a good question um, that I could talk for hours about, but I'll, I'll keep going. Um, okay, let's see. Okay, so Michelle says they have data on um, dual language immersion testing for the SEAL in Washington. Yeah, that, yeah, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about pathway awards as we go on. Um, let's see, we know from research that a native English speaker will require twice as long to become ES, but they don't earn the state seal until high school graduation. Okay. And then finally, I'll, um, finish with this last, this last question, then I'll go on to the next part. Um, how long are the seals valid? Is it for your lifetime or is it good for a certain time period only? Um, I guess that kind of depends. Well, I mean, once you earn a seal of biliteracy, you have that, you know, seal of biliteracy for life. Um, when students take that test to, to demonstrate proficiency on the assessment, um, some states say that you have to, like, like, for example, in Minnesota, I think, I think in Minnesota, once you, you have to take the you have to get your seal of biliteracy within three years, I think, of taking that assessment of demonstrating that proficiency. And then I know you have three years to request the college credit for that seal of biliteracy. Um, so I guess this question just depends on the context. Like it, you could take it to an employer 10 years after you earned it and say, here, I've got the seal of biliteracy. You know, it doesn't come with an expiration date. Um, but colleges and universities are going to have perhaps more strict requirements about within what time it had to be um, earned. With that said, it's all still so new that I don't know that there's a good answer to this question yet, that people have grappled with that yet. So that's that's a great question. Um, now that we've talked about the benefits of the seal of bioliteracy for students, for schools and districts, I want to talk a little bit about institutions of higher education. And this is some of my newest research some of, you know, kind of, you know, really cutting edge innovations that are going on. So um, this is, um, I'm hoping will grow and become even, even more um, popular. So there are more and more colleges and universities who are awarding credit to students who earn a seal of biliteracy. Like I said before, this is legislated in Illinois and Minnesota, but then there are other places that are doing so voluntarily. And this is really important because a lot of the students who earn a seal of biliteracy um, are students who may have learned English in school. Um, so it might be that their school schedules were dominated 
by, you know, let's say literacy classes or ESL classes or other classes that prevented them from being able to take advanced placement courses that their monolingual English speaking peers might have been able to take. Um, and so that creates issues of, of equity when students who have room in their schedules can take AP courses, get college credit, and then other students cannot. So with the seal of biliteracy, um, students who didn't have access to those courses can still potentially earn some what they call free college credit, you know, when they get when they get to college. Um, so that's that's something that that I think is a, an important innovation and something that I would like to see, you know, continue to happen. Um, there was a question earlier during the break um, from Michael about whether language proficiency earned from non-academic sources um, count towards the seal. Um, so the most equitable way to implement the seal of biliteracy is to allow any student um, to take, you know, an assessment to demonstrate their language proficiency. So when schools restrict that to only students enrolled in world language classes, that eliminates so many students who are proficient in other languages, right? Because most schools offer maybe Spanish, French, Chinese, maybe a few other languages, but we have students who speak Somali, who speak Hmong, who speak um, you know, indigenous languages, all these other languages, American Sign Language, um, who are also proficient and deserve access to the seal of biliteracy. So um, yes, you know, language proficiency learned or developed anywhere should count toward the seal of biliteracy um, and, you know, help potentially allow students to get um, college credit. If you were to click on this um, link, and I think I still have it. I copied and pasted it earlier so I could put it in the chat box. Yes, I did. Perfect. I put it in the chat box. So this is just a Google sheet where I've been compiling any colleges and universities that I've been able to find that have seal of biliteracy policies in place, credit policies. Um, I had um, a work study student in our department because I figured that person approximates students who are going to college, um, do a search on Google to try to find, you know, any places that I had missed. I put them all in this spreadsheet. Um, more and more are offering this. So I add to this list quite regularly. We just had our first institution here in North Carolina implement a, a seal of biliteracy credit policy. So I'm hoping that this list will continue um, to grow. So you can take a look at that there and feel free to spread that far and wide and send me any other places that you would like um, to see added to that. There are variations in how this is done. So um, places vary in terms of how many credits they award, um, how students request those credits, and for what languages um, the credits are awarded. So for example, um, I'll talk a little bit later about this, but some states have multiple tiers of a seal of biliteracy. So you might get like a gold seal of biliteracy for a certain level of proficiency or a platinum seal of biliteracy for a higher level of proficiency. And then institutions of higher ed vary how many credits they give perhaps based on which level you got. In most places, students have to request those credits. And this is what I see as one of the biggest issues with the seal of biliteracy in institutions of higher ed right now because, because of various factors. Um, one, students often don't know that they have to request those credits. They think it's automatic like other things and it's not. So that's problematic. Um, another issue, is that there's no easy way in most cases for college registrars to find out who got the seal of biliteracy because again, because it's this grassroots effort and it's done differently everywhere. They don't have like this automated system that like goes through students' transcripts or diplomas and, and notes if they got the seal of biliteracy. So this is creating a lot of work for modern language departments because they have to then go pull the student's transcript or pull the diploma or ask the student for evidence that they earned a seal of biliteracy. So this is something that if anyone has creative solutions to or knows more about, please reach out to me. And then this last one, again, this is can be an equity issue. So for what languages are credits awarded? Some places 
award credits um, only in languages that they teach. So for example, smaller university might only offer majors in Spanish and French. And so um, they might have a policy where only students who earned a seal of biliteracy in Spanish or French can get the seal of biliteracy. Again, that creates an equity. Um, so the policies that I like more are the ones that say you can get credit um, for a seal of biliteracy in any language. It might be an elective credit instead of a credit in the modern language department, for example. Um, but you know, students with a seal of biliteracy in any language can get credit. I have a different um, webinar that's available that I recorded for Avon Assessment and the Foreign Language Association of North Carolina that's available free online. And I can um, provide you with that link later. You can ask me for it that really delves into some of these issues. Um, but the American Council um, on Education, which a huge number of universities um, and colleges in the US are members of, um, they have published this on their website, their recommendations for how many credits colleges and universities should award um, for students who earned particular levels on the seal of biliteracy. Um, they've partnered with Avon Assessment, so they have scores here for the stamp 4S, um, but you could look at equivalents of this for, for the Apple assessment or, or other assessments as well. So they make a recommendation. I think this is really important that they've come forward and put this on their website so that we now have some guidance within institutions of higher ed on, on how to do this and how many credits to award. Um, I, I find this, you know, when, when we first started talking about this, when Illinois and Minnesota first did this, and I started talking to different places about, you know, why don't you offer credit to students who earn a seal of biliteracy? A lot of pushback that I got from modern language departments was that they, th they thought their enrollment would go down. They said, if we give students credit for the seal of biliteracy, then they're not going to take classes in our department and our enrollment's going to go down. And, and no one wants that, you know, at the higher ed level. But in interviews um, with individuals who are doing this work, they found that actually the reverse is happening. So what they're doing is they have retroactive credit policies or what's called a back credit policy. And that policy means that students have to take one class in their department. And once they pass that class, then they get the credit for all the classes that would have come before it or effectively for their seal of biliteracy. So they, they come in, they say that this improves placement because they've got this actual you know, proficiency score for the student rather than just a GPA or having them do some department placement test that they could you know, potentially change their performance on to get into an easier class, right? They've got this you know, proficiency score that they can look at, put them in the right course. Student passes the class, for example, and in some cases, they might get, let's say, 11 back credits or 12 back credits for the classes that would have come would have come before that. And what they're saying is that in many cases, in, in most places, that's you know almost a minor in the language. So it often only requires one or two more classes in the minor, and it's often you know well on the way to a major in the language. So what they're saying so far is that enrollment is actually going up because students take this class. Um, get the back credits and, you know, see that they're well on the way, their way to a minor or major. And so they stick around, you know, and finish that out. Um, I talked to um, Dr. Risha Cardone at um, Southern Connecticut um, University. She's, they have a, a great program there that does this. Um, and what she said to me too, that I thought was really important was, you know, she says, you know, we work hard to make those, those initial classes really engaging and really wonderful so that, you know, we get students in the door because of this policy, you know, and once we get them in the door and in our classes, you know, that's when we're able to snag them. That's when we're able to show them, you know, how valuable learning a language is and how much fun it can be. Um, so I think there's a, a whole lot of potential in terms of enrollment um, with this type of policy. Um, as I mentioned before, it also helps with placement. Um, so language departments, they don't have to necessarily administer that CLEP test or other assessments that they use for placement for these students. They instead, you know, have this score coming in from, um, you know, from a, a testing organization. This is really innovative work um, that Cecilia Monto has done at, I always mess this up, but it's, Metka, 
community college. Um, so in Oregon, um, they can, she got permission to award the seal of biliteracy, the state seal of biliteracy, you know, at the higher ed level. So now um, her students in her modern language department um, can earn a seal of biliteracy at the university. Um, so that's been really innovative. She published an article about this in the foreign language annals that I can um, give you a citation for later on. Um, but she said that that's been, um, you know, really beneficial for her students because if they didn't have access to a state seal of biliteracy in high school, they can get one, you know, in college. And I met with her recently at the actual conference and she said, you know, a lot of people think that, you know, that they just can't do it at the higher ed level, but she said it really was just a matter of, of asking permission and, and getting that, um, you know, getting others at the state level on board. So that was exciting. Um, San Diego State University also, they're doing, they're using the global seal of biliteracy at the higher ed level, um, but same thing, um, students in their program can earn a global seal of biliteracy. And again, they've said that that's, um, that that's had a lot of, a lot of benefits. Um, Amy Heineke, who I mentioned earlier and I are trying to put together an edited volume on, you know, how people are using the seal of biliteracy at this higher ed level. So if you know of anyone who um, is doing innovative work in that area, please, please let me know. Um, so I want to, I'm going to, the next part of the talk kind of looks at where I think we might need some work with the seal of biliteracy and where I think we're, we need to go moving forward. Um, I'm going to look at this question real quick before I move on. So outside of hosting programs such as this one, oh, what else can our museum do to support the seal of biliteracy? I'm going to save that question actually until the end um, so that maybe we can open that up for a whole group discussion because um, that's a really important question. So you're probably wondering now, okay, well, what is, I know the benefits. Um, I know the benefits for students, for schools, for curriculum. I know the benefits for institutions of higher ed. Well, what does this actually look like? So another challenge with the seal of biliteracy is that because it's done on, from a state to state basis and often a district to district basis, we don't have a great centralized database of who's earning the seal of biliteracy. Um, Arthur Chow with seal of biliteracy org has partnered up with Candace Black from New York um, and a few of my graduate students and puts together a report. So the, the latest one or the, the, the most recent one available is from 2019. Um, and it, when he collected the data then, there were 31 states participating that shared data. There are certain states that just kind of, they don't have the data or they don't share their data. But at that time of the 31 states that did, there were 108,199 students that had earned a seal of biliteracy in 67 different languages. So if you see this link here, you can also just Google National Seal of Biliteracy Report. Um, you can get a breakdown in terms of what those languages were um, and that sort of thing. He has another report that's supposed to be published any day now. Um, that has more recent data, I guess probably 20, 20 data, I would assume, but there's just not a great way to get those data yet. So again, I'm hoping if the best to act or other funding source comes through, we'll have better data access. This is a map from his report um, that kind of gives you an idea of how many seals of bioliteracy are being awarded in different places. California awards the highest number of seals of bioliteracy. It's not surprising one because they were the first to do this, um, to, to develop the seal of biliteracy. They also have a seat time policy where st any student who takes four years of a language is considered proficient in that language. And so that helps numbers go up. North Carolina is second on that list. And again, North Carolina has implemented the seal of biliteracy for a long time and has a seat time policy. The issue with the seat time policy, um, for those of you who've studied a language, knows that you know you can take four years of a language, and that doesn't mean you're necessarily at the intermediate mid level. I mean, there's so many other variables um, that that play into this, um, such as you know the type of curriculum and, and the student's motivation and and all sorts of things. So yeah, so while while that type of policy is great for boosting enrollment. Um, it doesn't necessarily guarantee proficiency. Um, and it also, again, 
you know, if you're not offering those assessments for languages, you know, that you don't teach in school, that can be an equity issue because a student who speaks Tagalog, for example, you know, can't take four years of that in school. So, but this is just kind of a map of, of what implementation looks like. Illinois also awards a large number of seals of biliteracy um, and does not have a seat time policy. So these various factors and these um, and these these variations in the policy from state to state impact, you know, how many students earn the seal. So what you see in this table here is the year that just is, this is a selection of states that I had the data on the year they adopted a seal of biliteracy. Their population of students that the government labels, you know, as as English learners because that you know, can influence the number of students earning a seal. The percent of students in that state that earned a seal of biliteracy in, in 2018 and then 2019. So what you see is that, you know, there's each year the number is increasing in, in most places quite dramatically. Um, in Illinois, we saw a big dip, but that's because they changed the cutoff score on the ACT for English proficiency. And so fewer students were reaching that score. And I just point that out because it just shows you that these little tweaks in policy can really impact, can really have big impacts. So that's something to think about. Um, Michigan, their number increased dramatically just because in, in 2018, they had just adopted the seal like a couple months before graduation. And so they made a, made a huge increase. And then states like Minnesota and, and Washington that are doing so much work to increase um, the number of languages in which students can earn a seal of biliteracy, you see big increases too in the percentage of students earning um, earning a seal of biliteracy. Okay. Um, so variations. I was just seeing if there were any questions that I needed to answer immediately, but I think I'm gonna um, save these and come back to them. So very, oopsie daisy, uh, variations in state seals of poly, uh, biliteracy. So they vary in terms of the name. Sometimes it's called um, a bilingual seal. Sometimes it's called a seal of biliteracy. It, it varies in, in North Carolina, it's called the global languages endorsement. Um, tiers, so sometimes states have multiple levels of a seal of biliteracy. Some states have one level. Um, the level of world language proficiency and the way to demonstrate world language proficiency varies from state to state. The same is true for English. And the types of schools allowed participation varies. So sometimes private schools are allowed to participate. More and more states, private schools are allowed to participate, independent schools. Um, but in some states, they are not um, just because the state doesn't oversee that and therefore doesn't track um, those type of data for students. Here's an overview of. Um, states that have one tier of the seal, two tiers. There are a couple states. I say that they have three tiers, um, but for, so Minnesota, South Carolina, Minnesota has um, a bilingual seal for students who are demonstrate proficiency. Um, and then they also have a multilingual seal and then they have different like colors, different levels of the seal. Um, so, that's just kind of a broad overview. You, you can definitely Google and find out what each state's requirements are pretty easily. I've mentioned throughout today, I've thrown around some terms like novice mid, novice high. Those come from the actual proficiency guidelines. If you're not familiar, it's this inverted pyramid um, to represent the amount of language skills you have at novice low is quite a bit smaller you know, than once you get up to the superior level, for example. Um, to give you kind of an idea, most states require teachers to be at the advanced low level to teach a language in the U.S. That means that they can talk in various time frames, they can speak in paragraph form, um, they're generally comprehensible to, you know, even people unfamiliar with language learners. Um, the seal of biliteracy guidelines that I mentioned earlier, they recommend that um, that states adopt intermediate mid-level for seal of biliteracy. The students have to be, you know, at this level, the survive and cope level, where they can, you know, create with language, they can speak in sentences, um, they can use various time frames. Some, although they'll make errors, um, some states have an intermediate high, like 
Illinois, I mentioned earlier, set their minimum level at, at intermediate high. Um, when I say that, most, most states require that you get that minimum in reading, writing, listening, and speaking. So for example, in Minnesota, if you scored intermediate mid in reading, writing, and speaking, but not in listening, then you would not get the seal of biliteracy. You would have to, you need to retake the test for listening and, and try to get that intermediate mid level. So here is just an overview. I'm always hesitant to share these types of slides because like I said, the seal of biliteracy policies are changing quite a bit. Um, states, you know, once they see research and, you know, have some experience and, and see guidelines, sometimes they tweak their requirements so when we collected these data, this was accurate. That was a couple of years ago. Um, but you can see that most states require anywhere from intermediate low um, to um, intermediate high. And then there are some states that have like higher levels of a uh, higher tier if you get advanced low, which is the level required for teachers in most states. So um, the minimum required um, proficiency level has a big impact on how many students, the percentage of graduates that earn a seal of biliteracy, that's, that's not surprising, right? So in states like North Carolina and New Mexico, where the minimum level of proficiency um, is intermediate low, 4.7% of graduates earn a seal of biliteracy. Um, states that set it at intermediate mid, it's 3.9% of graduates are earning a seal and intermediate high, it's 2.6. Um, so there's definitely trade-offs there. You know, when, when an individual goes to a company and, and shows their seal of biliteracy and says, I'm proficient in this language, if the minimum level is intermediate high, then they're much more proficient than, you know, if they got a seal of biliteracy at intermediate low. So there are there are trade-offs. The evidence um, too that a state accepts um, in terms of world language proficiency also really shapes the number of, or the percentage of students earning a seal. So various um, accepted methods are approved language assessments, um, passing scores on assessments of productive skills only. You saw these earlier, alternative assessment process, provisions for indigenous languages and then seed time. What you see here is that, you know, when states um, have a seed time policy, a higher percentage, California, North Carolina, students are earning a seal of biliteracy. When states offer an assessment of productive skills only. So like I said, some states will say, for example, if an affordable and practical assessment of the language isn't available in all four domains, then you can just demonstrate proficiency in writing and speaking, then a higher percentage of students are in the seal of biliteracy. And then um, down here at the bottom, alternative evidence protocol. So in states that allow for a portfolio assessment or some other means of demonstrating proficiency if an assessment doesn't exist, they're graduating a higher percentage um, of seals of biliteracy. In terms of English proficiency, this one's interesting. So um, passing an English language arts assessment, that's what some states require. So when I say that, I mean like the um, reading portion of the SAT or the ACT or the end of state exam, end of year exams. Um, we know that those are measuring a lot more than just English proficiency, right? Um, so some states also have a provision where it can just be an English proficiency assessment, like the stamp for us or the apple in English which um, you know, are English proficiency assessments, not necessarily assessments of the other constructs measured by English language arts assessments or SAT. Some states require minimum GPA in a course of English study and some require meeting graduation requirements. Hawaii was interesting because they required a minimum GPA like overall, not just in language, but I saw on their website just this morning when I was doing some work, that I think they're changing that next year to um, a minimum GPA in Hawaiian language arts, not you know overall. So that's gonna be a big game changer for them. Um, so again, um, depending on what the state's policy is, that shapes the percentage of students earning a seal of biliteracy. So in states that just say, if you meet graduation requirements, they're graduating 4.2% of students with the seal of biliteracy. Minimum GPA in a course of study, um, 
that's five, that's at 5.1%. But if I were to control for the states that have the um, seat time policy and take those out, North Carolina, California, then the um, percentage goes to 3.8%. I think that's important to do. I think this is a more accurate um, representation because the seat time policy really skews these data quite a bit. And then passing an English language arts assessment like the SAT or ACT, that percentage drops down to 2.3%. So there are a lot of intervening variables in these data, like year of adoption, you know, percentage of students who are labeled as English learners in the state. Um, but this is just kind of an initial pass at how these different variations might impact the percentage of students. Yeah, and I will say that um, I, I do want to point out um, Michelle's note right now, but that Avant has Linda Ignatz and Victor Santos, who are with Avant, um, have done some research and they found that productive skills, reading, so scores of, of reading and writing are predictive of stu students' proficiency across all four domains. And so their report finds that, you know, from their findings with, with their data, um, with the stamp assessment that, you know, a measure of just reading and writing should be, you know, uh, representative of a student's ability in all four domains. And then I'm gonna just, just here's just a little comparison policy chart of, of what I just talked about, but factors that correspond to higher percentage of students earning a seal are acceptance of seat time, lower minimum required proficiency level, acceptance of measures of productive skills only, having an alternative assessment protocol, and then graduation or GPA in course of English study accepted as evidence of English proficiency. Factors that correspond to a lower percentage are just the opposite. Proficiency assessment required as evidence, higher minimum required world language proficiency level, measure of all four domains required, no alternative assessment protocol, and English assessment required as evidence of English proficiency. Um, these are these are fun topics to debate, right? I mean, seat time, like we said, that does not mean you're proficient in a language, but that's going to boost your world language enrollment and and get your numbers up. So, what's your goal? You know, what's your purpose for this? That's something I'll share a link to a book we've written on seal of bioliteracy implementation in a little bit. But that's something you've got to define your purpose for seal of bioliteracy implementation. Again, higher minimum required world, world language proficiency level. Well, that's going to strengthen the value of the seal. When you go to businesses and say, I'm proficient in a language, and you have your level set at an intermediate high, then you're going to be pretty good at what you can do in that language. And the businesses can trust that, right? But you know, if it's intermediate low, again, you might get more students earning a seal of bioliteracy, maybe more students interested in, in taking, trying to get there, I'm not sure. Um, but, you know, if you tell a business you're proficient in the language and then you're at the intermediate low level, you know, they're not gonna wanna put you in a boardroom with individuals from other countries, you know, negotiating in that language. So that's something just to think about. Um, I just have a, a few more slides here. Let's see, we're doing great on time. So I am going to, Let's see where I'm, um, okay, I'm gonna stop there and answer a few questions because I think we have time for that. So some questions that I've seen come up. Has COVID produced any good results for the seal of bioliteracy? That's such a great question. I think what we're gonna see when the numbers come out is that the percentage of students earning a seal of bioliteracy probably dipped quite a bit during COVID. Um, because some schools just did not have the capacity during that time to do the assessments. Some students' world language instruction suffered as a result. With that said, something that's really positive is some of these major testing companies um, were able to pivot and offer at-home testing for students. So instead of a school having to you know, get a computer lab with headsets for all students, keyboard overlays and the different characters for character-based languages, students can now take the assessments, some of these assessments at home with a remote online proctor. So I think that that's really positive. I haven't seen any research on this specifically yet, but I think that that's um, a, a great, um, a great point. Sounds like I might have made an error when I was talking earlier. Productive skills are speaking and writing. 
um, where you're producing the language, speaking, writing. So if I said reading and writing, I apologize. Let's see, what else have I missed? Seat time is definitely variable in, in demonstrating. Yeah, the seat time policy, correct. I mean, I completely agree, Sally, does not help students whose L1 is not English because a lot of times schools that have a seat time policy are not motivated to offer um, a stamp test or an apple test. And so those students are left out. Students who speak a language other than one taught in school are, are left out. Um, Michelle talked about how language departments at UW are using stamp assessments instead of the old university placement tests for, for placement and courses. So that's great. She's trying to figure out a way to make the global seal of biliteracy, which is free, available to students who do that. Are there stats on percent? I don't, this is something I'm really interested in, Carolyn, that your question about are there statistics on the percentage of students not able to achieve the needed level? I don't, I haven't seen anything like that yet. Um, that's something I'm very interested in. I'm also really interested in, I published an article in Harvard Educational Review um, in which I interviewed linguistically diverse students, students who's, who come from homes where other languages were spoken about kind of what the test meant to them, how they decided whether to take it or not. And it just, you know, I didn't have, I didn't talk in that, that study with students who took the test and did not earn the seal of biliteracy. They didn't know at that point whether they had earned it, but I imagine that that could have huge identity consequences. And so that's something, you know, if, if I come from a home where Somali is spoken, I take the Somali test and don't pass. I think that that could be potentially very detrimental to one's identity. So I'm interested in studying that in the future. Um, let's see, we've had big challenges in Washington getting the sealed data transferred from districts to the state. So a number of large districts did not get reported. There's a lot of issues like that in the sealed biliteracy data reports um, with a, a lot of states. So again, those numbers that might not be entirely accurate. In terms of US territories, I don't know yet that Puerto Rico or Guam have a state seal of biliteracy in place. Let's see. Okay. And then we have recently started offering stamp English tests so that heritage language students can earn the global seal before high school graduation. Not unusual for students to perform high in reading and listening in English, but lower in writing and speaking. Sometimes they're not accustomed to recording their assessments or responding to three prompts. I think this is, this is another, something else that this brings to mind that I'm gonna talk about in just a minute. It's just that it's so important to have students, let them have more than one opportunity to take these assessments if possible. That's why I really like pathway awards where students can get some sort of recognition at fifth grade or eighth grade that they are on the pathway to biliteracy. Um, because otherwise this test becomes so high stakes and it becomes, you know, like a, only a one shot deal. Yeah, absolutely, Carolina. Um, okay. Okay, I'm gonna keep going for right now. Um, looking forward, what I'd like to see in SEAL of Biliter, sometimes people ask me, well, what would you like to see? Um, I'd like to see a greater uniformity in world language proficiency measures across the participating states in terms of minimum required proficiency level and in terms of what's required for that. If we want institutions of higher ed to really adopt this wholeheartedly, they need to know that a seal of biliteracy from one state is just as valuable as a seal of, seal of biliteracy from another. So let's say that a student from North Carolina, where they got a seal of biliteracy for intermediate low proficiency by taking four years of study, for example, um, is applying to the same place as a student from um, Illinois, where they have to get intermediate high on an approved language assessment you know, that's the, that, that's, that represents very different things. So I'd like to see more uniformity there. Um, flexible forms of evidence for less commonly tested languages. We need greater equity in our seal of biliteracy policies. Um, so um, for a student who speaks the language that's not taught in schools or for which there um, isn't a, a, an assessment that only costs, you know, $25 of that language, um, I'd like to see 
um, you know, flexible forms of evidence accepted for them. In, a, in the book that I published, that Amy Heineke and I published for Actful, um, which I'll show you toward the end of this presentation, Michelle Aoki was really instrumental in helping us with the, the chapter in that book on assessment because Washington has done so many great things in, in that area. But we do offer prompts and suggestions on how to create your own assessment for less commonly tested languages. And then streamlined options to demonstrate English proficiency. I don't think that having a minimum required level on the SAT or an ACT is an equitable, is the most equitable approach, right? I think, um, you know, a lot of times what that ends up setting up is that the level of English proficiency required for a seal of bioliteracy is way higher than the level of world language proficiency required, right? So I like the use of those English language proficiency assessments like STAMP or Apple or, you know, um, acceptance of graduation, you know, as, as evidence of English proficiency. We need to work harder too on promoting students' home languages. Um, you know, the researchers predict that by 2025, 25% of students in our schools will be emergent bilingual learners. Um, this group of students historically has a 10% lower graduation rate than their peers. Um, and only 18% advance to four-year colleges and 12% earn a bachelor's degree. I think the seal of bioliteracy could be a huge game changer, you know, in those numbers. Um, when I've talked to students, you know, well, I'll show you in a little bit, but they, they talk about how earning a seal of bioliteracy really motivated them to go on to college. Um, and we also know that when our multilingual learners are denied access to literacy in their first language, they experience negative cognitive and academic effects, such as lower test scores, school attendance, engagement in the learning process. There's all sorts of great research from Th Thomas and Collier that, that show, um, show some of these results. Um, another thing that I think is really important that's starting to take hold in certain places are pathway awards. Again, if we wait till high school to tell students about the seal of bioliteracy and to teach world languages, it may not be enough time, you know, to earn a seal of bioliteracy, much less to become proficient in a language. So there are certain districts um, in the country. We're currently doing a study right now in Chicago Public Schools um, on their pathway awards where students you know, at grades five and eight, for example, or, or on the slide from Lee Summit um, schools, it says, you know, grades one, three, and five, where students can take an assessment. It doesn't necessarily have to be an official, you know, assessment from Language Testing International or a bot assessment. It can be something created in-house, but they get recognized as they are on that pathway to proficiency. Um, here is an example from the Language Opportunity um, coalition, I think it is in Massachusetts on kind of what, what they recommend pathway awards looking like. So you see intermediate low proficiency in all domains at elementary and middle school, intermediate mid, middle and high school, and then reaching their goal of intermediate high, you know, by high school. So I'm just going to kind of start to wrap this up by saying, you know, who is the seal of bioliteracy for? There's so many debates in the research and the news and people in my community about who is the seal of bioliteracy for? Is it for our students who are in world language classes? Is it for our multilingual learners? The answer is that the seal of bioliteracy is for everyone. We want all students to have access to learning another language, to maintaining their home language, and to earning a seal of bioliteracy. Um, all students, you know, all students deserve this opportunity. So I'm going to kind of wrap this up with quotes from two students. So this Neve was born in Thailand to Hmong parents, and he moved to Minnesota as a child. Um, Amy and I met him shortly if, after he'd taken the seal of bioliteracy assessment, but before he had received his results, and he was nervous. He said that his parents complained that he spoke English too frequently, which caused tension at home. So we asked him, you know, have you told your parents about the seal of bioliteracy um, that you're going to take this test? And he said, no, absolutely not. Um, he said, you know, that his parents that would get their hopes up too high. Like he, he didn't want to tell them. So one year later, when we followed up with him, he excitedly shared that he'd earned a platinum seal of bioliteracy and said that he felt proud of himself. When he had received the letter sharing the accomplishment, he initially hid it from his parents, but invited them to the award ceremony hosted by the school. 
He described how proud they were when they arrived at the ceremony and learned about the recognition of his biliteracy in Hmong and English. He reflected that it was totally worth coming to school on a Saturday to take the seal of biliteracy assessment. He said that it motivated him to learn more about his own culture. He also felt that the recognition would be useful for his international business major. Anna, just trying to move this, grew up in rural Illinois. We met her in one of our studies there. I'm in a home where only English was spoken. She attended schools in a local public school district and began studying Spanish in eighth grade. And so when reflecting on her learning, she said to us, you know, I haven't been the best Spanish student, um, but despite her struggles, she loved Spanish class and she adored her teachers. And talking about the courses, she explained that the teachers don't just integrate grammar and all the textbook stuff. They bring in culture. They bring in your personal life. She elaborated, I can't tell you how many times we've done a speaking assignment about us or a writing assignment about us. And that really helps you connect with the language. And I feel like that's what makes learning Spanish so much easier and so much more fun. So as a high school junior in Spanish four, she took a test of language proficiency and said that she did awful, but decided to move on to Spanish five and take the test again as a senior. She wanted the seal of biliteracy. Um, and she told us, I got the seal of biliteracy and my senora, her teacher cried because she was so happy. It made me cry. I was so happy. And she said, it's just things like passing the test. You see yourself grow that really motivate you. So these are just two examples of how this, this recognition, you know, is important for all students. So I'm going to pause there. Let's see. I'm going to look at these couple of um, parents don't have to sign a permission slip to take a seal of biliteracy assessment. That's a good question. And I'm not sure of the answer to that. I have not heard of that. Um, but I don't know for sure. Amy Heineke and I mentioned before we've published, we have two books that we've published on the seal of biliteracy. This one just came out in 2022 from Actful. It offers um, a 5P framework on how to implement the seal of biliteracy. So it starts with defining your purpose for the program, walks you through figuring out what proficiency assessments you're going to need, what you need to think about that, the partners that should be involved in implementation, what types of programs are going to set students up for earning a seal of biliteracy, um, and then promoting. This isn't something you really think about. I haven't talked much about it today, but this is so important. You know, so many students are not aware of the seal of biliteracy. Teachers aren't aware. Parents aren't aware. So how to spread the word. Whenever I do talks like this, Actful gives me a promo code. <laughs> so if you intend to purchase a copy of this, um, you can get 15% off the next couple of days with this code in the bottom corner from them. Um, let's see. We've also published an edited volume um, where we had a lot of really great contributors. This is just a selection of them on the right here that wrote chapters for this book on their seal of biliteracy work. Laurie Olson, who was part of Californians Together, who originated the seal of biliteracy, wrote chapter two, I think it was. And then you see a lot of people who are really instrumental in seal of biliteracy's names listed here, Nicole Scherf, um, some, uh, Justin Fisk in Illinois, um, Guadalupe Valdez wrote kind of the closing of our book. So this is really great. The, some individuals who did their entire dissertations on the seal, like Marta Burnett, Alma Castro, um, Tanya De Leon. So you can check that out um, if that's interesting to you. This one's more research focused. The other is kind of a conglomeration of our research and you know how to put it into practice. 